Thanks, Fix. Um, and then moving straight to Michael. Michael, tell us your story. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Holmstrom. I'm the CEO of Stempunks Education. So we're based in sunny Brisbane, Australia. We've got offices in Austin, Texas. And what do we do? We, we've got a great passionate team. We're very passionate about STEM education. We do that across the world, including countries like Ghana, Vietnam, Latin America, and of course, the US and Australia. So I guess I want to share with you today a bit about the story that we do in space. So I guess the challenge that we face, not just here in Australia, but overseas, is that how do we inspire the next generation of space explorers and space technicians, and, and in general, getting kids into STEM-related fields of work? So when we do STEM education, we've seen this now since we've been around for about five, six years now. STEM education can get very focused on technology, which means we talk about the bits and bytes, the coding, the drones, the robotic stuff. But we took a bit of a different approach from day one. We said that STEM education has to be about problem solving. So by doing programs like this is a space 2101 program we're running across the world, we now focus a lot on a process where we utilize design thinking as the first step in everything that we do. So without boring you too much about process and how we do things, the key thing here is that we teach the kids about design thinking as a problem solving tool first. And what happens when you do that is that you get a very diverse student base in what you do. An example could be if I tell you, look, next Friday, we've got a coding um, class going on here. We're going to use JavaScript and C++. By using that rhetoric, I've already narrowed down my audience to a quite a small audience. But if I talk to you about, look, today we're going to do um, problem solving, we're going to utilize design thinking, and maybe STEM tools like coding, 3 designing, what we do, you get a very diverse student base in those programs. So we start off with design thinking, we go into developing STEM skills, a lot around 3 design. Yes, we use coding, robotics, and drones, and everything we do. But then we step quickly into project-based and problem-based learning. So we basically give the students a framework and the skills they need to attack real world problems. So in terms of Space 2101, that's based on a futuristic view about the world and how we utilize space. And we talk a lot about space sustainability. So the students also gets immersed in a bit of a, we use something called process drama. So I'm not sure if you come across, but process drama is a great way to get students not just to participate in problem solving, but be part of an overarching story. So all the way through these five-day programs that we now run, we run a massive one in the UK early in the year. We're now going to Dubai and Thailand and the US next year. The students take on board roles. They become technicians, they become marketers, they become problem solvers. And we utilize a lot of video and audio in these presentations to get students to take part and not just sit there and listen for five days, but actually become part of a role in the full mission that we now do with the students. So now we've gone from, yes, utilizing coding and stuff and problems on, but I'm now part of a bigger story here. I feel like I'm almost stepping into these roles. And by doing that, we now get a lot of girls coming into this program. We're very proud about the student base we have for these programs. We've got about 40, 50% of girls in all the programs that we do. So process drama, STEM, problem solving. And then the final thing, this is a screenshot from the UK program we did at Teesside University earlier in the year is now we link this with industry partners. And this is a very, very important point because you have to make, I believe personally, STEM education relevant. And what I mean by that is that teaching coding, robotics, and isolation, to me, and I'm a technical person, I love this stuff, to me is an absolute waste of time. When you put it into context of career pathways, problem solving, and real world scenarios, that's when kids go, I get it, I understand this. So we're very fortunate with this program. So we have NASA astronauts coming in, helping us out to inspire the kids. But we're very careful about saying that this is not about turning every kid into an astronaut. It's about learning about the space industry. It's about breaking down virtual barriers, what the space industry is all about and understanding all the support structures in terms of human resources. It could be around accounting, whatever it might be. All those people help out to create that ecosystem for space travel. So look, I'm very passionate about this. I can talk about this all day, I won't. But I think the final remark is that what we've learned, and this is now doing education across the globe with teachers and schools, is that 
the key things is that make it relevant. By making it relevant, you attract a very diverse student base. Focus on problem solving. Because if you do that, you now have got a global framework for delivering STEM education. And then, yes, use STEM tools like 3 design and coding, all this beautiful stuff to give kids the tools, not just to understand the problem, but to get a strong sense of, I can be part of the solution. So as I said, I can talk about this all day. So I'm going to stop there. Hopefully that made sense on what we do here in Australia and across the world. I'd love to take your questions later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michael, and, and all the panelists. Um, can I ask, is there anyone in the room who would like to put a, a question to the panel? Because I realize you guys aren't getting that much of an opportunity to put questions. Anybody want to put a question from here? No? Do we have any questions online, Dins? No questions online. Okay, well, I have a question. My question would be, because you're, you're all coming at this from a very different perspective, what do you think um, is kind of the biggest barrier that stands in the way of more, you know, of these initiatives taking off and, you know, there being more outreach? What, you know, what are the barriers to why aren't we doing more and how do we, how do we overcome those barriers? Um, I'll start with you because you've been listening politely to the other panelists. Very, very, very open question. Um, lots of potential stoppers. Um, obviously, I can only really talk to the perspective of, you know, UK SEDS and kind of putting on initiatives from a charitable perspective for university students. Um, for us in particular, some of the stoppers, like I mentioned, were funding. Um, although we get lots of sponsorship and support from industry partners um, and, you know, donations towards our charitable cause, um, you know, there are some things that are still beyond us simply because it's, it's expensive. And as a charity, it's kind of hard to get that money. Um, and, you know, industry partners, you know, there's only so much you can expect sponsors and supporters to kind of, you know, donate towards doing those STEM activities. Um, I think, like I mentioned in the opening, um, that stopper is felt more particularly at a local level. Um, so we have, I think, just over 40 branches now at universities across the UK. And they want to participate in our competitions and they also want to do their own initiatives their own out you know a lot of them do outreach on younger levels so you know we help the university students and they in turn will often do outreach initiatives um, with younger school students um, and they are looking for funding to do those things they're looking for funding to do our competitions um, and they're looking for funding for everything else they do and we end up in direct competition with our own branches um, so not only are our branches fighting each other for funding, we're fighting our own branches for funding. Um, and it kind of creates this big sort of whirlpool of of everyone kind of, you know, emailing the same companies. And uh, I'm sure um, the companies are getting, you know, tons and tons of emails from all these different university students going, oh, we need this much money to do this competition from all the different all the different uh, branches around the UK. And then, you know, how 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 do you then say, oh, well, this this branch and this group of students should get funding for it and this one shouldn't. Um, so I think that that can be quite a quite a stopper as well um, on 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 the the whole putting on initiatives and students taking part really. Thanks, Joshua. I, I'd like to ask any of the um, any of the business people participating online or in the room today. You know what what actually would make that easier? What would make it easier for business to participate in STEM outreach? There's the time factor and the cost factor. Um, but, you know, my own impression is that actually there's a lot of willingness in the UK. We actually have um, a government sponsored and industry sponsored program called One Million Interactions. And it, it was a commitment by the industry in the UK to touch one million, uh, you know, young people a year with uh, STEM events and outreach and engagement. Um, and it was a, it was a great and laudable ambition, but actually I'm not sure how easy uh, companies in the space sector have found it to be to, to get involved with that or, you know, to to engage with it. Is there anybody in the room that's had any involvement with one million interactions? Well, I think um, looking at the business's problems and and challenges and setting up live briefs, just like you just had next next door. So looking at the business, what do they need, where are they where are they finding their biggest problems and obstacles, and then opening it up to schools, colleges and universities and seeing if there's potential live briefs to come up with ideas and look at a problem in a different way, in a simpler way, in a more creative way is a good way of doing it. 
Um, Michael, you work with a lot of uh, industry partners. You know, how is it that you make this relevant and useful and good value for money for them so that they are engaged? I think it's, it's two parts to that question. The first one is that industry partners is key to everything that we do. But there's an education process with the industry partners saying, what is this all about? This is not about just you know, sponsoring an event and just putting money in just to get the logo in there. It's about engaging students to really understand the true career pathways in the regions. Like we had a great example. We did this at uh, TSA University. We had Fuji Biotech, one of the key sponsors of this event. And they were greatly concerned about their future workforce and trying to attract local students and retain that workforce in the area as well. So I think once you get the industry to understand that the engagement is going to start quite early in the school years, we start all the way from grade six, seven, and all the way up to seven, eight, nine, ten. When you get to 11, 12, it's almost too late to get that spark lifting kids that already made up their minds. So I think once the industry understands the true value of engaging with kids at this level to light that spark, the conversation change. This is not just a sponsorship dollar ticket. This is about true engagement to get these kids to go, I want to go there when my sort of future careers develop. That's one part of it. But then you have the school side. You know, if we just start talking about coding and STEM as extracurricular activities, we've isolated the value in a school system. If we start talking about fully integrated cross-curriculum education, the value of this experience have gone through the roof. So now you've got value on the education side with schools, which means you attract the students really easily. And you've got industry going, hey, this is part of our core business. This is part of our core attracting new people into our industry going forward. And also, of course, giving back to the communities. So those are probably the two key things that we've learned from doing this across the world. Thanks, Michael. Um, Charles, I know when we spoke before, you, you expressed that actually sometimes reaching schools themselves can be challenging. Um, did you want to reflect a bit on you know, whether you have any uh, outreach partnerships with businesses um, and you know, this question about how you get schools on board with it? Thank you, and, and I don't know whether you noticed that um, uh, technology was almost failing me. Um, and, and that is one of the, <laughs> that's why I dropped over one point, uh, to change connection. Uh, but I'll say one of the issues we face is technology because sometimes you have um, uh, issues around connectivity. Um, say you want to organize a webinar with kids and then um, power goes off or they are not in an area where they can easily access internet or uh, broadband is not uh, easily accessible. So I would say that is one of the issues that comes along. Um, but, but I also want to agree with what Michael was saying in terms of uh, alignment with um, uh, the, the goals of the aspiration of the outreach aligning with, uh, with what the companies want or what the companies um, are seeking to drive it. And sometimes if you miss that alignment, um, then the funding does not come your way because again, uh, the company exists for a particular reason. And it is more importantly for uh, the institutions uh, or the people who are undertaking the outreach to align uh, the aspirations with those ones of the companies. So that again, as they do what you call the corporate social responsibility component, then they feel they also still being able to deliver uh, a bit on, on what they are supposed to do on, on their mandate. Uh, but the other point that I wanted to uh, indicate is also uh, the component, and the funding was mentioned, I will not repeat that. There's also the component of the teacher, uh, because again, technology has evolved over the years, um, and the teacher have, have not evolved as fast as, as the technology has evolved. And sometimes they act when, when the teachers are supposed to be the bridge between sometimes the children and the information, sometimes they become the barriers. Uh, because I say, or we say, normally a teacher will only teach what they understand. And sometimes if they do not understand, then they will not teach it. Or if it's, it's a concept that they're not comfortable with, uh, they will not go ahead and teach it. And, and one of the things that I've realized in terms of how we could scale up the activities is, is using the internet, for example, because the kids, uh, we say they are more digital natives. How then can we leverage on their access? Uh, because sometimes uh, the kids could access the, the internet even from their phone. How can we then package the information in such a way that they're able to 
accessing people with a small video in TikTok and make it relatable for them. Uh, and I like what my, uh, Michael was saying, when you're trying, when you uh, focus on addressing a problem, then it kind of resonates with, with what the aspiration or what, what they think is important in their lives is. And, and if sometimes um, uh, when you miss out the link between what they're supposed to do in the future and what they are studying today, then it doesn't make sense for them. And, and sometimes I would say the adults are the best reflection of that. If you make out something that you feel doesn't add value or you don't understand how it fits into your life, then it, it doesn't make sense for you. Uh, and for the kids, sometimes you give them a lot of leeway in terms of expecting them to explore too many things. But again, when you don't make it important for them or make it um, help them understand why they need to study it and what it means in their future life, then it doesn't make sense. That's, that's absolutely true. <laughs> um, it will go in one ear and out the other, won't it? Um, I, Vix, I saw you nodding a lot while Charles was talking. Um, what, what do you do to, you know, teach the teachers? And if they're not, you know, uh, if they are sort of standing in the way, how do you reach the, the kids in spite of the teachers, I suppose? I, th I think, I mean, I've, I've agreed with everything everybody's said, and, and I think that the key um, to getting the message across is, as Michael said, is to keep it relevant. Um, but in terms of teaching the teachers, the, the best way to do that is to develop um, a communication route, and that could be through uh, resources, um, through books. Uh, but you, the thing with using anything with teachers is you have to make it really simple for them to use because they've got so much to do um, that if you're going to make something complicated if you say you need to go to this website you need to download this and then you need to plan your lesson from this and then you need to do this they're just going to say no I, I haven't got time to do that so what you have to do is you just make it very very simple um, the stem ambassadors um program is really good because you can actually get that outreach into schools and the teachers have very little that they have to actually do for that um, so that's very very good and as I say books literature resources all that side of things is is the way to go but I think in terms of um, getting the message across and to get the interest building is more public outreach not necessarily um, schools outreach because with public outreach, you can then um, guide the government. You can you can become a policymaker, or sort of thing, you know. Because if you have public, um, what's the word, uh, engagement, you then have the, the the politicians want to go with what the the public needs. So, if the public are on board with everything, with space flight, with exploration, with human exploration, or robotic exploration, or whatever it is. Um, they are not going to be questioning any government that puts money into it. So you're going to find that you've got better funding st streams by giving better outreach to the general public. And I mean, I heard somebody say something about, you know, going online. There are things like the Kerbal Space Programme, you know, absolutely fantastic outreach. And it, it's a game, you know, and the kids play it and it's fantastic. And I know a lot of adults who play it as well. Um, and these are the kind of ways that we can engage with absolutely everybody out there. Uh, as I say, you know, I write books. I don't do it for a, a finance side of things. I try to get funding, but as uh, Joshua said, it's very, very difficult to, to find funding out there for educational outreach. Um, I'm very interested in any other options in which you can actually fund something that can go into schools. And I, and I do like the opportunities, um, but yeah, it, it does come down to funding. Um, teaching the teachers is not necessarily necessary if you've got the STEM ambassadors to do the outreach. Um, that's that's really good thoughts, Vix. Um, I think it's we one thing we recognise is we're actually not very good at telling our stories to the general public. Um, we're at hiding our our light in the space sector so at least in this country and i think um that's something we need to get better at i think there's a pincer movement isn't there where you engage the young people get them to engage their parents and teachers and community but you also have to engage the general public and and get those stories out there so they're more interested in participating in the conversation i think there's a question online dins two statements online 
So we have two statements from the uh, virtual um, attendees. One is from Dan Hawke, which actually does ring true. And he said, uh, I am feeling that education alone can be a glass ceiling, that education ought to be attached to a project or a mission objective. One other level is to go beyond career to a mission object idea, true engagement that means something. And, and uh, you know, having worked in this in and around this industry for so long, those projects need to come to fruition quickly i would say personally because you know a lot of space missions they get launched and then you know they're, they're there for decades and you know, if people get to see the objective very early it inspires them more and then angela mathis of think tank maths uh, has posted in the questions i've asked her to put it into the chat about her team who actually do participate in a lot of stem and she's got a link to an organization called smartstems.org um, and i think we'll get that into the chat and get it um, available to everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Jens. Um, and I've got an eye on the clock. There's a question in the room. Hey, um, so my question is kind of a, a, a point that was raised earlier about interdisciplinary. And um, I'm a software engineer by trade, and I thank the designers a lot. Otherwise, everything would still look like Windows XP or probably worse, the terminal. Um, so my question is about how do we get people involved away from STEM, like your designers, your policy, policy makers, and especially when people are at a young age, because um, a lot of people I speak to always think that you kind of have to be a mathematician or an engineer to get into this space. That's a great question. Um, being none of those things, not a scientist, technologist, engineer, or mathematician myself, um, it's a question I think a lot about. Um, Vix and Charles, I'm going to put that to you. Um, Vix, first, you're, you're not you're not an engineer. How do you how do you get <laughs> the other people with the other skills interested in space careers? Um, right. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm not an engineer. Um, I I can do engineering, but I'm not trained in it. Um, in terms of getting other people interested in the careers, um, I mean, the thing is, is space is a big industry and there are lots of careers in the space industry that don't involve having a, a degree or having um, science, technology, engineering, maths um, training. But obviously it helps a lot because of the, the type of content that you would have to, to work with. But I mean, we have space lawyers, we have uh, communicators like myself. Um, and if you're willing to learn and if you're willing to do um, do the groundwork, do the research, you know, you can get into the space industry. Absolutely no problem whatsoever. But you sometimes you've got to be creative. Um, I enjoy science, I enjoy space, I enjoy learning all of the details that uh, are involved in the space missions, and I enjoy communicating that out. Um, so whilst I, I am a STEM ambassador, I also reach out to those kids that aren't interested in STEM, because as soon as you say STEM to some children, they shut down and they're not interested. That's why I have the toys. That's why I've got the Lego. You know, there's lots of different ways in which you can connect with with people and children. I, I couldn't agree more. And I absolutely would encourage anybody who isn't already a STEM ambassador to look into becoming one, because actually you don't have to be a, you're not teaching STEM. You're just telling a story and telling a story about what inspires you. Um, Charles, I'm going to put that question to you and then ask very quickly uh, for last thoughts from Michael and Joshua here in the room. Charles. I totally agree with uh, what Vix has said. Um, I'll give the example, um, and uh, again, um, in line to what she mentioned earlier about the World Space Week. So we had a challenge this year uh, for students, and we were asking them to um, draw some concepts of space. And, and that was one of the components to make it feel like it's relatable to them because we were not asking them to be engineers, we were asking them to be artists. And then it's from that concept that they would try and see, hmm, maybe there's a bit that I could play if, if I'm doing design work uh, and I could find a way to, uh, to space. Uh, the other component will be, uh, we, we have been working with students who we give them challenges and then they have to present. Uh, so they understand that it is not only the engineering concept that it is important, is how are you able to communicate that? You see, sometimes we as engineers, my, my background is engineering, we're not very good in, in sharing the information of our science. 
And sometimes we need the communicators who are able to do that. Um, if you need to do videos, essentially we need people who are in that particular category. So how best do we then tap into that resource? And essentially it is a deliberate effort where you uh, create pathways for them to be able to see uh, those opportunities. So again, we see, again, in terms of the sector, we see the, the need for all the careers, but now they have to be pointed out so that we're able to see how they're able to appreciate those opportunities. Yeah, that's great. And in the exhibition next door, we had a whole panel of paintings and poems about space junk, which was fantastic to see. Um, Michael, last thought from you. Yeah, just, I mean, what Charles and Vix are saying, I fully I just want to amplify what they're saying is that I did a, I did a TED talk a while back which, with a quite controversial topic saying that the world doesn't need more ideas when TED is all about spreading ideas. Now, what I meant by that was that there's so many ideas around. Everyone's got ideas. What we need are a new whole new generation of kids and people that can transform ideas into outcomes and value extremely fast. And that means taking what's up here and then creating tangible outcomes. So yes, we talk about STEM here, but at the foundation of what we do here, it's about utilizing design thinking as a human-centered tool to create solutions and problem solving. And coming back to how do we create, you know, I guess, more opportunities in this space industry and, and, and this sort of future career pathways. For me, it's about breaking down virtual barriers. There are two key things that we do. One is the inspiration to get kids to understand, okay, this is for me, but it's breaking down the virtual barriers. If you walk into a classroom in grade six tomorrow morning and say, hey, we're going to talk about scientists today in STEM, they'll probably see a middle-aged man in a lab coat standing in a lab. Now, we know that STEM is so much more. The space industry is so much more. So I think by lifting out those human stories behind the opportunities, you get that connectivity. And I come back to once again, STEM should not be just about the coding and all this stuff. They're, they're just tools in a problem-solving scenario. Artificial intelligence can be applied to so many industries, including space, as a problem-solving tool. But you're doing the wrong thing by sitting in a machine learning class with 30 students for three terms. That is a waste of time. Now, quite controversial, yes, but I've become quite comfortable saying that because I see this now over and over again across the world. So without harping on too much and getting too passionate about how we should change education, I think it comes back to breaking down virtual barriers, inspiring with highly relevant content and focusing on the human stories and not the technology. I couldn't agree more. It's all about the people. And I'm gonna give this person the last word before lunch. Thank you. Yeah, I think just really reflecting on what Michael was saying there about, um, he mentioned it before, but mentioned it just there, um, framing things as problems rather than saying, oh, today we're gonna to be doing like a coding challenge or you know, this particular math challenge. It's when you put it in that context of this is the problem we're going to solve. This is the issue we're gonna address. And it doesn't matter what background you're from or your interests are, the things you specialize in or you're interested in as a student um, or a school child, you know, these can be used to address this problem. And if people are interested um, and inspired by this problem, then you know they'll be willing to um, sort of take part and address the problem with the tools and the things that they find interesting and, and can use. And that way, I think we're able to bring you know lots of people into the fold um, beyond just that sort of initial inspiration. Although that initial inspiration is so incredibly important to get people you know into it. You say space, and young kids go, "Wow, like I love space. Space is amazing. We've got rockets, we've got satellites. You know, we're doing paintings and poems and all these things where you know at a really young age you you just you just love those kind of sci-fi ideas. Um, if you can then sort of sustain that initial inspiration beyond the point of it being um, sort of a wild idea in their mind into something tangible that they are then inspired as they get older to look for problems that they can work on and solve and that they can actually see themselves going into uh, as you know an industry or as a profession then continuing that kind of initial inspiration through to the ages where you know um you know 15 16 17 doing gcses going through to a levels or apprenticeships um then that goes from being more than an inspiration down to something where there's a, a real belief that these are things that they can engage in and participate in, um, whether they're STEM or whether they're from an arts or humanities background as well. So it, it really needs to be uh, all the way through pipeline, framed as a problem with everyone involved.